Well, this morning it was class. Get started here. Uh, we want to work, still working in the book of Ephesians to teach chapter 2, starting at verse 11. And before we get started, though, we want to say a prayer, open the class, and we want to remember those that are sick with the virus, the people that are losing loved ones. We want to remember them and uh, remember our country and the leadership is fixing to take over and hope things will start going better than what they have and praying for the church and for all of our members and that, uh, you know, they just, we need to be lifted up this time of turmoil and uh, uh, misunderstandings of what's going on and, you know, I don't understand a lot and I'm sure you don't either, so let's just go to the Lord in prayer this morning and, uh, and welcome him into our midst. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come, dear God, to the throne of grace, we thank you for today that you've given us and the blessings. Lord, we want to thank you for the prayers that you've answered for us here. And Lord, we pray for those that are sick, the ones that lost their loved ones, pray for them, our country, our leadership, and pray for our church, Lord. Bring us together, hold us together. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, Apostle Paul, as he wrote this letter to Ephesians, he had started the church there, and on his trip back, he finds something here that I think is kind of unexpected to him. Because as he writes this letter, in verse 15 and 16, he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto the saints, I ceased not to give, says, I ceased not to give thanks for you, make him mention you in my prayer. So Apostle Paul was really pleased at what he's heard, what he's seen, you know, that the people were believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and believing that he did die on the cross to save uh, those lost souls. So when we go to chapter 2, starting at verse 11, we find here that Apostle Paul is giving him, uh, bringing to remembrance to him the way they used to be, the way things were before the Lord Jesus came. And here he says in verse 11, it says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So he was reminding him who they, who they used to be and where they used to be at, you know, and this being called circumcision and uncircumcision came about in the covenant that God made with Abraham back in the book of Genesis where we find it. And in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9 through 14, he tell, it tells us this, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep the, my covenant, therefore, Thou and thy seed after thee in this generation. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of the foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that has born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must, be, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the son circumcised man child whose flesh of the foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, and in 19, he goes on to say, And God said, Sir, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. So, there the, God made the covenant with Abraham about circumcising all the men child and 
to be a token in their people, with their people, God's nation that he was yet creating through the lineage of Abraham. God was going to make a people to him to be his people, that he could dwell with them. You know, God walked with Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden, but and since then, the Bible doesn't tell us much about God being really close to others until it comes to Abraham. And then in Abraham, he has, started, he has decided to establish him a nation through him and his seed that he could, they could be his people and he would be their God. Okay? So as Apostle Paul teaches on here about the circumcision and uncircumcision, he says in verse 12, he says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens and from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. You see, back then, and up till Jesus came, you know, and died, all those that were of the lineage of, of Abraham was without God. I mean, you know, God was, they weren't his children because they weren't in the covenant of the circumcision part, you know, and the promises and the laws that was written there, okay? And, you know, in the, in the Ten Commandments and all, that his people kept through Abraham. Now, the other people, they didn't keep it, you know, and, you know, and that's, that's the reason, you know, that God, that these people that was around, that weren't God's people at that time, that when God sent uh, Joshua across the Jordan River to take hold the land of Canaan, the people was totally destroyed because they were not, but they were without God. And of course, Jesus Christ not being yet in the world, they were without him. So that's what uh, Apostle Paul was telling here, being without Jesus, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They were just not God's people uh, from Israel within the covenant that God had made through Abraham. He said, strangers from the covenant, a promise. Yeah, they didn't know, and they weren't blessed with it. Okay, no hope without God in the world, you know. And then uh, when God uh, established his covenant there, uh, Genesis 17, 6, 7, and 8 tells us this, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make, a, make the nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee. You know, that's the thing. Knowing these people know that the God that created heaven and earth is be the one that they worshiped, and God was the one that blessed them. Of course, you know, as we read in the Old Testament, they were, whenever they got disobedient, God went to discipline them and, you know, chastise them. And that's the same way it is today. It ain't changed. It says, and, uh, it says, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So when Joshua crossed over there in the land of Canaan and took over that, then... He was, you know, he was being their God all the way. They, they just, no one stood in front of them. No one could, could take them down because God was with them. God wasn't with the other people because they, at that time, that they were what we call Gentiles. Without God, they weren't God's people. Okay, let's go on down to number 13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off and made nigh by the blood of Christ. So Jesus changed things. When he came and, and you know, and he, what he teached, what he, you know, was preaching, his teachings and all to the disciples and to the multitudes that was around was totally different from what they had before, other than the fact that he taught that God the Father he came from him. He was doing God's will, right? And he says that uh, he was made nigh by the blood of Christ. So what God, what Jesus did on the cross just didn't allow himself to be put to death. There was a whole new realm 
of things that were taking place, that Jesus was dying there for a purpose, a purpose by the will of God to pay the sin debt, uh, the blood sacrifice for the sin debt of the world. You know, and that's for people around, they didn't, they didn't understand that at the time being. But once it was preached to them, they started believing and seeing what the promise of was that Jesus, what he did, and they started taking the scope of the magnitude. You know, and that's the thing today. We don't understand a lot of this because our mind is not opening up. We're not really digging in to where we understand that, that God loved us so much. You know, John three sixteen, he loved us so much, that, and that's what he was doing because he sent Jesus here to die for us and to pay that sin debt. So our indebtedness is to Christ for doing what he did. You know, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, then Peter said unto them, says, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, and that's what they, what Peter and the apostles and those that was with them there in the upper room when the Holy Ghost came down upon them and they were baptized, with them, the Spirit of God entered in to each and every one of them there. <clears throat> you know, and that's what happens today. When we get saved, the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost comes within us and dwells. That is a major difference from all. You know, today, the gift of God through Jesus Christ is to all who will come all who God calls and the answer you shall receive it says for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call for all who God called <coughs> to repentance and you repent will receive the, not only the forgiveness and salvation and your name represents the name of Christ your, the Holy Spirit enters in to be with you from now on, to guide you and teach you the things that you need to know, the things that you're right and wrong. When you do wrong, when you need to repent of that. <clears throat> okay, verse 14, Apostle Paul comes on down and says, For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The middle wall of partition, the things that the high priest used to do to take and go through the veil into the Holy of Holiness, Jesus took this down. Jesus himself made up between us and God, he placed himself, that we could pray to our high priest, Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, we pray to him who is alive and well on the right hand of God that will take our request, our prayers to God to receive the blessings. Jesus paid for this price at Calvary. Remember? Okay. So it says, for our peace, for he is our peace. Peace being Freedom from war and strife, according to Webster's Dictionary. From freedom from war and strife. Two, an anger to, an arrangement, agreement to end wars. Number three, freedom from public disturbance, law and order. <laughs> Proverbs 16, through 16 and 7 says, When a man's ways pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's why it is so important that you and I please God, that we worship him, we pray to him, we stay in contact with him every day, and listen when the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something.
God loves us, <clears throat> and he wants to transfer us from here to where he's at. And when he does that, we want to be ready. And to be ready, we got to please God by doing what he asks us to do. Number four says harmony. <coughs> Five, an undisturbed state of mind and serenity. St. John 14, 26 through 28 tells us this. These things have I spoken unto you. Now this is Jesus speaking. It says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. Now listen. He says, Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And he says, not as the world giveth. It's not what we give here, what we receive here, peace from the, in the world here today. Jesus gave us a holy peace. He gave us a peace of mind knowing that we, when we accepted him, that he did forgive us of our sins. He did write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he is going to come back and get you. This is the peace of mind that you're going to receive from him, <clears throat> okay? And he said, let your heart, says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, you've got nothing to worry about. If you go or if you stay, you're a winner either way, right? If you're on the, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ. Since ye have heard that I have said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. So just think, anything that the Lord has telling us, God will back up. This has come from God. Jesus told us what God wanted us to know. And this is what he wants us to know that he sent the Lord Jesus God, whosoever would believe upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Calm, quiet. In Psalms 46 and 10 tells us this, we talk about being calm and being quiet. Verse 10 tells us here in Psalms, says, Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the the heathen, and I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that God. You know, there's times that we need to be quiet and feel the presence of God around us, you know, because sometimes when he's speaking, we don't hear, and that's what gets us in trouble, right? 